Bay of Elodium Moist Pradium, Ante Colorado. The acronym is ANPAC. I'm the Chief Judge of the Consulate Court. Uh, today is Class 68. Class 68. What did we learn in Class 67? Well, we're still going over the Act Out of Service of 1906, Chapter 5, right? So we're trying to finish out Chapter 5, but we're still going in much deeper about Article 102 of Chapter 5. And why is that? It's because the International Court of Justice, in the case commonly known as France versus United States of America of 1952, on page 197, the ICJ starts to point this out. They start specifically talking about Article 102. So therefore, it's incumbent upon me here at AMPAC to be the sheriff on you and try to impress upon you what the world courts said about Moorish subjects, right? It's very important for us to understand what, exactly what's going on right now. A lot of Moors don't realize that they are still more subjects. Why is that? It's because your treaties absolutely express, right? In the Madrid Convention of 1880, Article 15, paragraph one says, Moors have an obligation to return to Morocco and consent back to a Moroccan government, but that government must be what? Competent, meaning it has a constitution that's been ratified, deposited, and promulgated in accordance with international law. Right? And that means that Moore State is also acceded to and ratified, deposited, and promulgated all of its treaties. Now that state has what's called full powers to be able to enforce its state's rights. To enforce what's commonly known as the triple principle. And what is the triple principle? Sovereignty and independence, integrity of domains, and economic liberty without any inequality. However, the Moors can never enforce the triple principle without having a state. That was the answer to the test. However, once you have a state, what's the next thing you have to do? You have to, have to start enacting legislation immediately, right? So in addition to that, you're enforcing your council court and your council court orders, i.e. its decrees, its decrees, its ministerial decrees, i.e. its judges, I mean, excuse me, you're, you're, uh, now you're enforcing your uh, judgments, orders, and opinions, right? You're enforcing your judgments, orders, and opinions. That becomes the substantive law of your state, right, through council court. And the International Court of Justice informed us all on page 202, France versus United States of America, 1952, right? It says, by that way and that way only can you enforce the laws against the United States. And you have to enforce it through council court, all right? That must be understood. So in class 67, we were going into a lot more detail about how did the Moors end up being Americans, right? A lot of Moors say they're Moorish Americans, right, which is a misnomer. There's no legation, there is no laws, there's no treaty, and there is no constitution on planet Earth that says that Moroccan Moors are Americans. So we have to continue to learn where we're making our mistake, Moors. Uh, you know, the, the reality is this. We've dealt with a lot of miseducation. And it's incumbent upon ANPAC study session to start to spread a light on it, right? It's not a matter of trying to convince anybody. It's a matter of sharing information that we can all learn together. We're all in this together, right? So let's keep learning about the understanding of how we became Moorish Americans, because we're not Moorish Americans. What is our nationality? Moroccan. But how can you say you're Moroccan and American? Those are two different political statuses. Right? LeBron James can't say he plays for the Lakers Cavaliers. There's no such team as the Lakers Cavaliers. So we have to start identifying the party. And when we start talking about contracts, in every contract, the parties must be known. So let's keep talking about these parties according to treaties, because treaties supreme law to land. All right? So as everybody knows, we open up about the Constitution. This is an example of AMPAC's Constitution. This is about our latitude, longitude of our state, right? All the Moors will need their own Uti Pasadena's jurisdiction, and that Uti Pasadena's jurisdiction is outlined by its latitude, longitude, according to your constitution. Each constitution will have to outline the boundaries of your state. And like I've told all the Moors, now you have to now take your constitution, ratify, deposit, and promulgate it with the United Nations and according to Article 102. Once you do that, the next steps after that is now what? Acceding to all your Moors treaties acceding to the United Nations Charter of 1945, then acceding to their conventions, their resolutions, and their declarations. That becomes international law for your state. After that, the Moors need to start to enact their own internal Moroccan law, i.e. legislation, and start to enforce that through your council court. All right, let's move on.
Okay. So as the Moors know, right now, we're still in the act of Sarah, 1906, chapter 5. And we've really started to examine what's going on in Article 102. So for the record, I'll read Article 102 again. Article 102. Every confiscation, fine, or penalty must be imposed on foreigners by consular jurisdiction and on more subjects by Sharifian jurisdiction. So therefore, Sharifia means Moors, the competent Moors of a competent Moor state have the jurisdiction over more subjects and the competent Moor state's jurisdiction is over foreigners. What type of foreigners? Citizens of the United States of America. Citizens of the United States international organization, right? This is the reason why we're going into this more. We have to identify the parties. They just mentioned three parties. Who's the three parties? Foreigners, more subjects, and the more state government, right there. Three parties. This is a contract, right? The parties must be known, okay? So, as we know, we were going into understanding about who the Moors are, how do we end up being American. So let's, let's continuously get into this a little bit more, right? So, so who, who, who have we been talking about? Dred Scott, right? So Dred Scott, at that time, was an it so jure Moor subject branded as a Negro. But there's no such, as, such thing as a Negro. Everybody has a nationality on planet Earth. Everyone. And Dred Scott was an it so jure Moor subject. But what type of Moor? He was a Moroccan Moor. Okay, we'll talk about that today. Who else are we talking about? Okay, all right. We're talking about the Moorish Americans who have a nationality card. The Moorish Americans don't realize they're still subjects of Morocco, right? They're still subjects. However, they're stateless Moors. Why do I say that? Because Moorish Americans have a nationality card. They don't have state ID. They were not issued state ID from their state. So therefore, the state hasn't recognized the Moorish Americans because there's no such thing as Moorish Americans. It's the classification that was made up by the Moors. Why? Because the Moors were studying the definition of Noah Webster's Dictionary of 1828. We'll talk about that today. All right? So the Moorish Americans right now are in a stateless status. They're stuck between the United States of America trying to get out of that jurisdiction to return to Morocco. But what they don't realize, they needed a pen to sign off on the legislation or the application to consent back to a Moorish state. Right? In order to consent back to a Moorish state, that means there has to be a Moorish state. And how do you have a Moorish state without a Moorish constitution? And that constitution has to now be ratified, deposited, and promulgated. And if you haven't done that, then you don't have a Moorish state. So therefore, that makes the Moors stateless. And this is why they refer to this as being a nationality card instead of state ID. Here's the worst part. The Moors say they're Moroccan, while simultaneously saying they're American. You cannot conflate the two. There's no such thing as a Moroccan American. You're either Moroccan or you're American. That must be understood. We'll go into that today, okay? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to diminish the Moors, but we have to start telling the truth. We have to correct this, right? With reference points. Because documentation and legislation beats conversation every day of the week. What does that mean? I'm going to continue to show you documentation and legislation that beats the conversation that the Moorish Americans have continued to pass around and we're Moorish Americans with this. This is what you call private law. Public law is an ID issued from your state. Private law is something you created by yourself or you went to some third party website and got some nationality card. And none of it was issued by a public state. This is what Moors gotta understand, okay? Let's continue. All right. So, I was talking about this in class 67. In class 67, I read over this, I'll read over it now this time. Moroccans recognized the Americans in 1777, 1786, and 1789. In December 1777, the Moroccan Sultan Mohammed III included the Continental Congress of 1777, now modernly known as the United States of America of 1789, in a list of countries to which Morocco's ports were open. Morocco thus became the first country whose head of state publicly recognized the newly independent colonial continental congress in 1777, 
And then their constitution in 1786, which was the Continental Congress Constitution, followed up with the recognition of George Washington's de jure constitution of the United States of America in 1789. That's a little bit of history, right? In a snapshot. But let's get into it a little bit, okay? How did Moors end up becoming American? Let, let's keep talking about that. Okay. Here's a timeline I put together as a snapshot so Moors can, can uh, take some notes on this, right? Obviously, you can go back and watch this as many times as you need to. We're going to get into a timeline. I'll read this out loud. Okay, timeline of historical events in the Empire of Morocco. Now, now there's a lot of history that took place, but I'm just trying to get the highlights, okay, Morris? Go to the quick highlights so we can start understanding what happened to us, okay? Now, one thing I want you to notice quickly as I go through this, I keep highlighting Morocco. There's a reason why I highlight the word Morocco. I'm trying to get your attention about something. It's going to all make sense to you. Okay. Number one. All right. In 1774, the 13 colonies dissolved their charters with Britain. In 1775 to 1783, the British go to war with the 13 colonies. In 1776, the 13 colonies declared independence from Britain. In 1777, Morocco recognizes the 13 colonies as protected. Protected by who? The, the Sultan, right? He gave them protections, all right? In 1778, Morocco appoints the French consul to represent the 13 colonies on behalf of the Sultan. We'll talk about that today, that France came in on behalf of the Sultan to represent the 13 colonies. From 1774 to 1785, a lot of history takes place. So I'm not gonna get into all that history right up now. I'm trying to get to the snapshot, okay? I'm trying to query it down, okay? I'm trying to make it concise. Right here. In 1786, Morocco recognizes the Constitutional Congress Constitution in good faith. So in 1786, the Sultan recognizes the Continental Congress Constitution, right? Because they're now getting into the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Okay? All right. So right here. In 1786, Morocco forces the colonists to sign the Treaty of Peace and Friendship in 1786, right? So the Sultan signs it first. And then the college signed second in 1787. Let's get into that. Let's give you a quick timeline and we'll start getting into some of this information. In 1787, Morocco and the Continental Congress fully ratify the Treaty of Peace and Friendship into international law. In 1789, Morocco recognizes George Washington's new constitution for the United States of America after Washington ratified, I'm just shrink this down a little bit, after Washington ratified, deposited, and promulgated the Constitution on December 1st, 1789. That's what George Washington did in his letter to Sidi Muhammad, right? 1789, he sent Sidi Muhammad a copy of his Constitution. That's ratified, deposited, and promulgated, right? Okay. In 1789, George Washington's letter to, Sult to the Sultan disclosed that the United States is in the dominions and empire of his majesty, the Sultan of Morocco, right? In 1791, George Washington writes another letter to the new Sultan of Morocco after Sidi Muhammad died. See George Washington's letter to the Sultan, 1791. We're actually gonna read that, but let me finish with my timeline. In 1798, the Moroccan Moors are placed on the Alien Enemy Act as aliens and denizens, i.e. denationalized. In 1828, Noah Webster, listen. In 1828, Noah Webster's Dictionary, all of a sudden, defines Moroccan Moors as Aboriginal Americans. Listen, here's the definition. American, right? Webster's Dictionary, 1828, American means a native, let me just minimize that, means a native of America, originally applied to the aboriginals or the copper-colored races, found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. What just happened? Listen, this is what Moors have been hanging their fez on is a definition 
by Noah Webster's dictionary, every last more, went to this definition and looked up American means a native of America, originally applied to the aboriginals or the copper colored races. So in 1828, after all that history I just told you, the United States of America signs a treaty with Morocco, with Moroccans. And the Moors turn around and look at the definition in 1828 after all that history and turn around and say, yeah, but uh, according to Noah Webster's dictionary, we're Americans. And we immediately call ourselves Moorish Americans because of definition in a dictionary. But yet, I just showed you a brief timeline of legislation and treaties. How do we end up being Americans? Because we consider this to be the absolute truth. We consider this to be legislation as if this existed in a treaty, and it did not. This is a definition in their dictionary. But yet, the United States of America is signing treaties with Morocco and the Sultan, they know exactly who Moors are, they know exactly who the ipso jor Moors subjects are, which ipso jor Moors subjects are Moroccans, and all of a sudden now, the Moors see a diction in a dictionary, 1828, Noah Webster's dictionary, all of a sudden defines Moroccan Moors as Aboriginal Americans. Why do they do that? You have to understand, Moors, they listed us under what? Alien Enemies. Act of 1798. This is very close to the year 1800, right? 1798. Their job was not to recognize us as Moors anymore. Their job was not to recognize Morocco anymore. They wanted to act like Morocco didn't exist, even though behind the scenes they're signing treaties. But what do they tell their citizens? Oh, this is America. Behind the scenes, this president, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the plenipotentiaries are signing treaties and negotiating with Morocco to remain in the land of Morocco. Then they turn around and tell their citizens, oh yeah, this is America. So what do they say? They found who? So they lie, right? So they lie, it's called fraud. So they define that America means a native of America. Originally applied, see this word applied? It was applied to us. What was applied? The word America was applied to us, but we were never American. It was simply applied to us as a connotative linguistic, as a misnomer, right? So it was applied to the aboriginals or the copper colored races, and we ran off like a race and claimed and proclaimed ourselves as being the Americans, the Americans, all because Noah Webster said it. The President of the United States of America didn't say this. The House of Representatives didn't say this. Their Senate didn't say this. There's no treaty that said this. There's no declarations, no conventions that say this. Only a definition in Noah Webster's Dictionary, and the Moors ran off with it. Now watch this. I'm going to scroll back up, and I'm going to come back down. Watch this. Look at all these dates, okay? So look. Morocco, Morocco, look. Morocco, 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 Morocco. George Washington's talking about the millions, right? The millions and the empire. Is then Morocco, so you keep going, Morocco, Moroccan, Moroccan Moors, and all of a sudden you get to 1828, and all of a sudden we become what? Aboriginal Americans. You see, see what just happened? We got hoodwinked. We fell for the okie doke. Why is it that they needed us to think that we were Americans? Because they needed us to acquiesce, to take on the name and brand of American. And as soon as you call yourself American, that means you can no longer use the consular courts of Morocco because the consular courts of Morocco is for who? Moroccans. So they fooled us into believing that we as Americans, we fell for it. This was what they call counterintelligence, and it worked. We branded ourselves as Americans. And then they turned around and assisted us, right? How did they assist us? They assisted us with what? 14th Amendment, 1868. Right? So this happened in 1828. So they, they're building up. They're building up to try to get these Moroccans to call themselves Americans. Right? Let's continue with the timeline. This will make sense to you. 
Okay. In 1836, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship is renewed for another 50 years between Morocco and the USA. Let's pause right there. 1836. Look at the date. Look, look, more. Look, look at what we've done to ourselves, more. Look at this. The definition of American comes out in 1828. They brand us in a dictionary being Americans. And in less than what? Eight years later. Look, 1828. Eight years later, look what they do. The administrators turn around and do what? Sign a treaty, 1836. With who? The Treaty of Peace and Friendship is renewed for another 50 years between Morocco and the United States of America. But they just labeled us as Americans. And the Moors took it. Hook, line, and sinker. We fell for the okie you got to understand, they were telling their citizens everybody's American because they wanted to forget that it was Morocco. They didn't want their citizens to know it was Morocco. But they knew behind the scenes with a pen, the administrators, the president, their executive branch, judicial branch of the United States of America was signing contracts with Morocco. Let's continue. In 1847, Dred Scott petitions United States of America courts as a Negro. Even though, even though his treaty status was a subject of Morocco. That was his treaty status. That was his treaty status. In all the treaties, it refers to us as being subjects. Okay? Let's continue. In 1855, Abraham Lincoln represents a Portuguese Moor. In 1857, Dred Scott petitions the Supreme Court of the United States of America, and the court determined that he was plaintiff in error. In 1861, Abraham Lincoln becomes president of the United States of America, and the Civil War ensues. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln enacts an executive order to free the subjects of Morocco by emancipation of proclamation. In 1865, Abraham Lincoln gets assassinated, and the vice president becomes the new president known as Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson and the Congress enact the 14th Amendment and breach the treaty by fraudulently, fraudulently classifying the subjects of Morocco as being citizens of the United States of America. That was the 14th Amendment of 1868. Let's continue. In 1870, the United States of America Congress enacts the Naturalization Act and breach the treaty by classifying the subjects of Morocco as being citizens by legislative powers of the United States of America. In 1871, the United States of America creates the United States International Organization with the plan to undermine the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1836. In 1880, the Sultan of Morocco enacts the Madrid Convention to protect the rights of any subjects of Morocco. 1906, the Sultan reigns in the order to protect the sovereignty and independence of the empire, the integrity of domains of the empire, and the economic liberty without the economic liberty without any inequality in Morocco. All right? Et cetera. So what's happening? Everything I read to you is a timeline. Let's, let's go back up. It's all about Morocco, 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 Morocco. George Washington is talking about Morocco, 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 and then bam, 1828. We turn into Americans all of a sudden. And then right after 1828, guess what happens? They go right back into talking about what? Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1836. Morocco, Morocco, right? So what happens? Now the United States of America is getting into some history, says, you know, these Dred Scots, eventually they're gonna find out they're subjects of Morocco. Because we just told them, we just told Dred Scott, listen, we just told Dred Scott, he was plaintiff in error, right? We just, we just told Dred Scott, he's plaintiff in error. What does that mean, Morris? Listen, they knew that he wasn't a subject. I mean, excuse me, they knew he wasn't a citizen. Let's go back to the Constitution. Let's go back to their Constitution. Right here, Morris, okay. This Constitution, United States of America, Article 3, and the Constitution of the United States International Organization, two different constitutions, similar language. 
And right here in the end, it talks about what? Citizens and subjects. Okay, let's increase that. It talks about what? Right here. Citizens or subjects. And who was Dred Scott? Okay. They said Dred Scott was what? Plaintiff in error. Why? Because he wasn't what? A citizen, right? Because he wasn't a citizen, which by default made him a subject. But what you got to understand is this. See, they had courts for their citizens, but they didn't have no courts for subjects. Why? Because the treaty says subjects use what? Comp court. All subjects supposed to petition the sultan to utilize consul court as their remedy. And here's what happens. As soon as they told Dred Scott he couldn't use their courts, immediately they knew that was a human rights violation. Because all humans have a right to petition, to petition a court to seek remedy of both civil and criminal disputes. And they basically told Dred Scott he could not bring a civil or criminal dispute to their courts. So immediately, immediately they violated his human rights and they realized even slaves and subjects and Negroes deserve a court. Everybody deserves a court. So what they do, they turn around and said, okay, let's omit, let's omit subject status as a legal personality or political status. And now omit that under what's called an omission, an omission, and they got rid of that and now everybody's just citizens. Right? Everybody's just citizens. Why? That way they can put everybody underneath their jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment. Okay, let's go back to it. Of the 14th Amendment, right? 14th Amendment. Okay, here we go. 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, 1868 says what? Uh, this is the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the United States International Organization. 14th Amendment, 1868 says what? Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. So they made Dred Scott a naturalized person. That way they could have jurisdiction over him as what? A citizen. No longer a subject. Because they know, they knew that subjects deserve to have a right to a court. But they also knew those subjects had a right to what? Constant court. So when they took away the status of subject status and made all of the Negroes, Blacks, Colored, African Americans, minorities, Negroes, etc., citizens, immediately they came under the jurisdiction, meaning the civil and criminal courts of the United States of America. That was a violation of the treaty. The treaty afforded all the subjects the right to petition cause the court. As soon as they made the Dred Scott citizens, they could no longer petition cause the court. You see? Okay. What's that? Okay, we went through the timeline, right? We went through the timeline. Okay? Went through the timeline, and Moors now think they're Americans, and they're not. They've always been Moroccan. Okay? What happened? Let's talk about how, how did the United States of America come to be, right? Let's look at a little bit of history of how the Americans ended up becoming Americans. I'm talking about the expatriates of Great Britain and the expatriates of Europe. Those are the Americans. How did they become Americans? Because Sidi Muhammad allowed them to classify themselves as the Americans. He didn't care about what he called themselves. He just cared about them paying rent. Okay? All right. So this document right here is called the uh, Revolutionary Diplomatic Correspondence of the United States. Edited under direction of Congress by Francis Wharton with preliminary index and notes historical and legal. Uh, published in conformity with the Act of Congress of August 13, 1888. Okay? Uh, volume 4. Okay, these are the Washington papers, all right? This came from Washington, D.C. Copy this stuff, okay? So we're going to scroll on down. Scroll on down. Okay. We're we'll scrolling on down. I want to show you something more. Now, this is very small print. So I do apologize in advance if you can't see this. Okay. This right here is correspondence. Where the Sultan of Morocco started to now appoint France 
as being the cultural representative on behalf of the 13 colonies. All right? Okay, so this took place in 1778, okay? 1778, here's what's happening. 1778, okay? Mother, can you can you read this right here? Copy? Copy of the declaration which has majesty. The Emperor of Morocco, whom God preserve, orders to be notified to all the consuls and Christian merchants <clears throat> who reside in the ports of Tangier, Saleh, Mogadore, dated the 20th of February, 1778. Okay, so the, now the Sultan of Morocco is giving notification to who? Great Britain and all the other European states, okay? He's talking out loud in this order. He's giving a, legis he's giving a legislative order, okay? Okay, mother, right here. That in future, all vessels which carry Russian, German, Prussian, Hungarian, Neapolitan, Sardinian, Tuscanian, Genoese, Maltese, or American flags may freely enter into the ports of his dominions, and in consequence of his determination, Okay. Okay. So let's pause right there. So right here, copy of declaration which His Majesty the Emperor of Morocco, not the Emperor of America, the Emperor of Morocco is now doing what? He's listing the American flag. The American flag. He's claiming the American flag under his protection. This is 1778. Even though they wasn't Americans at that time, they just the 13 colonists trying to get their recognition. But the Sultan recognized them as what? The Americans. Right? And he said to them, he's saying to the world, especially to Britain, he's, he's really talking to Great Britain about this. Okay? What does he say? He said that the American flag, okay, the American flag, I'm going to try to increase as best I can, Morris. The American flags may freely, this is why I know, enter into the ports of his dominions. What's his dominions? Morocco. So he's protecting the Americans in that moment. Okay? That's 1778. Okay? Listen. That's it by his decree. Okay? All right. Now let's get over here. Okay. All right, let's read this now, okay, mother. Okay, this is now another decree by the Sultan in the year 1779, okay? Now we're in November 1779, okay? Signed by who? Signed by who? Signed by the Emperor of Morocco. About to now see another order. He's protecting the citizens of the United States of America. He's providing protections for them. Why? Because he wants to get into trade and commerce with them because he sees them as his new tenants in the land of Morocco. He wasn't talking about Moroccans. He's talking about Americans. Who are the Americans? Expatriates of Great Britain and Europe. That's what you gotta keep in mind as we read, okay? Just a moment, okay, mother? We're going ahead and get started. Copy of a French translation of a writing in Arabic. The most authentic of those that are written at the court of His Majesty the Emperor of Morocco. Read that one more time. Copy of a French translation of a writing in Arabic, the most authentic of those that are written at the court of His Majesty, the Emperor of Morocco. Let's pause right there. So the Emperor of Morocco is at the court, and he's submitting court orders. And these are court orders that are issued from the Sultan himself, and the court's backing him up. Okay? All right, let's get into this moment. Let the name of the only God be praised. There is neither wisdom nor power, but what proceeds from the Lord most high and most mighty. We make known by this our present and generous writing that we have appointed the Christian Dowdy Bird Kyle, who is the bearer hereof to officiate as counsel for all those nations who have no consuls in our dominion and who are the empire of Germany, Russia, Prussia, Naples, Sardinia, Rome, Tuscany, the states of America, Genoa, Ragusa, Ragusa, <clears throat> Hamburg, Lubeck, Danzig, all of whom may come into our ports, and each of them their traffic under the flag of his nation, such as it may be. 
The said council will assist them by our order in whatever way, in whatever may be useful to them, in like manner as the other councils do towards the subjects of their nations. And all the officers and governors of our ports will acknowledge him for a consul as they do the other consuls. And whichsoever of the said nations shall come into our ports, they shall not be molested by any of our officers or command, command, commandants whatsoever of our ports. To all our captains whom we shall order to cruise by sea, the said consul will give a passport. And we renew our order to him to hoist the flag of peace at his house without being therein opposed by anyone. He may also hoist it in any port whatever where he may have a house of commerce and he shall be mediator between us and the said nations because we esteem him. Given the 8th of the moon of Al-Qaeda, 1193, 1st of November, 1779, signed by the emperor. Okay, so what's happening? The emperor of Morocco has just issued for this Frenchman, Christian Leobert Kaye, to represent who? He starts listing a bunch of state names, right? So think about it, Morris. None of these states, none of these states have representation, right? So the emperor has issued for this guy, Leobert Kaye, to be the consul in Morocco to represent Germany, Russia, Prussia, the Prussia, 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 <laughs> Naples, Sardinia, Rome, Tuscany, the states of America, right here. Okay, listen. So now the Sultan says he's bringing a Frenchman to represent the states of America. Why? Because the states of America at that time didn't have their own courts. They're still now battling with Great Britain. Great Britain had extended their parliamentary courts over the 13 colonies, and the 13 colonies didn't want those courts no more. So therefore, the Sultan of Morocco said, don't worry, United States of America, I'll protect y'all. You come under my protections in my domain. I'll let France come over and represent you in, in the courts, okay? Listen, so now you get down this section here. So the Frenchman, shall be a mediator between us. So the Frenchman shall be a mediator between us and the said nations above because we esteem him. Who are they esteeming? The Frenchman on top of the Sultan, right? They appreciate the representation. Okay, let's listen to now what's happening next. Okay, now we're gonna read a document from 1780, okay? 1780. 1780, okay? Two years later, let's listen. See what's going on with this Frenchman, okay? A lot of more is aware of this information, but we're going to go over it anyway. How the United States of America came to be. Okay, mother. We, Stephen Dalibur Kyle, a French merchant resident at Saleh, appointed by His Majesty, the Emperor of Morocco, consul of those foreign nations who have none in their, his dominions to protect them in that capacity on all occasions and to be mediator between him and those nations, certify to all whom it may concern that the above copy is conformable to the original compared by Don Miguel Casori, the interpreter of his Catholic majesty. In faith, of which we sign the present certificate, sealed with the seal of the Consulate of Peace at Saleh, done at Aru. Jews, where I happen to be in passing, the 21st of April, 1780. All right, so the Sultan of Morocco has a Frenchman of France coming in to act as a mediator on behalf of the United States of America. Why? Because the United States of America is always in a constant war with Great Britain. Why is the United States of America in constant war with Great Britain? Because Great Britain saw them as treasonous. They had left their land. They were paying taxes to Great Britain. They were abiding by Great Britain's laws, that extraterritoriality laws that had extended from Great Britain all the way into Morocco. Then now, all of a sudden, in 1774, the 13 colonists start to dissolve their contracts, i.e. their charters, with Great Britain. So immediately, Great Britain comes to war with them in 1775. They start to attack the 13 colonies. So Sidi Muhammad sees an opportunity to protect them, 
because he wants to now charge them rent to continue to remain in his land. So he sends France over to protect him. Why? Because France didn't like Great Britain. Okay? Listen. Okay, let's get into a little bit of storyline. Moore's got to find out the history, okay? We got to understand the history, Moore's. Okay, let's get into this, mother. All right, so this is correspondence. 1780, okay? Mother, from the top. Observations on Mr. J. Adams' letter of July 17, 1780. Translation. One, the, reason, the reasons which determined the Count de Virgins to give Mr. Adams that advice are so plain that they must appear at first view. Okay, pause. Who is Mr. Adams? John Adams. John Adams, United States, right? So who is he talking to at this time? Great Britain. So John Adams is sending correspondence to Great Britain. France is coming in to represent the United States of America and John Adams because they're trying to get their independence away from Great Britain. And France is coming in to represent them, okay? At this time, the Moroccan government has recognized them as Americans. Not Moroccans, they're not Moroccans, they're Americans. Who are the Americans? Expatriates of Great Britain, and the Americans are expatriates of Europe. Listen. Okay, mother, start with you. One, the reasons which determined the Count de Vergennes to give Mr. Adams that advice are so plain that they must appear at first review. One, to be solicitous about a treaty of commerce before peace is established is like being busy about furnishing a house before the foundation is laid. So what is the great, see Great Britain is talking smack to John Adams saying, why are you petitioning me to start talking about getting into a treaty where we're still shooting cannons at you? We're still shooting musket guns at you and you sitting here talking about a treaty. We don't recognize you as the United States of America. You're still British to us and you're treasonous. You stop paying taxes, you got you dissolve the charters, Right now, you are criminals. And how are you petitioning me talking about a treaty when we deem you all as, as criminals and we'll never recognize you as being American? Okay, let's continue. Two, in the situation in which America stands at present with regard to England, to announce to that power that they have forgotten her system of tyranny, her, cruel, her, her cruelties and her perfidy is discovering too great a degree of weakness, or at least too much good nature, and inviting her to believe that the Americans have an irresistible predilection for her, and to fortify her in the opinion she entertains that the American patriots will submit through weariness or the pre preponderating influ influence of the Tories. Okay, continue. Three to propose a treaty of commerce which must be founded on confidence and on a union equivalent to an alliance at a time when the war is raging in all its fury, its fury, when the court of London is wishing to ruin or to subjugate America. What is it but to give credit to the opinion which all Europe entertains, conformable to the assertions of the English ministers that the United States incline towards a defection and that they will be faithful to their engagements with France only till such time as Great Britain shall furnish a pretext for breaking them. Stop. So Great Britain wants to break up any type of relations, breaking up them. Who they want to break up? The United States of America relationship with France. And they also want to break up the fact that they don't recognize the United States of America. Even though they call the United States of America, they don't recognize them yet. They're saying that they're now treasonous for leaving their homeland, okay? Let's continue, it's gonna make sense to you. Two, a person may be furnished eventually with plenipotentiary powers without being under the necessity of publishing them until circumstances permit him to use them. This happens every day. Mr. Adams is charged with three distinct commissions. One, to take a share in the future negotiations for peace, Two, to conclude a treaty of commerce with Great Britain. And three, to represent the United States at the Court of London. It requires no great effort of genius to show that these three objects cannot be accomplished at the same moment of time, nor that the, last, the, the two last ones cannot serve as an introduction to the first. 
It is necessary, first of all, to obtain from England an acknowledgement of the independence of America, and that acknowledgement must serve as a foundation for a treaty of peace. Pause. It's right here. See, London is saying, we don't recognize America. If y'all want independence, y'all got to check some boxes. You see what's happening? Great Britain didn't recognize America. They're like, we don't care about what you call yourself. You're British to us. And right now, we just want to go to war with you because you owe us taxes and you're breaching contracts, right? So, but they're going down on this right now. Great Britain's talking to John Adams like this, okay? Okay, well, let's continue. And that acknowledgement must serve as a foundation for a treaty of peace. Until this is obtained, Mr. Adams cannot talk of a treaty of commerce. To propose one, while the court of London is flattering itself with the hopes of subduing America, and while with that view it is making the most strenuous efforts, would, in the view of the court, be to propose what was chimerical and, what be, and would be taking a step which it would hold in derision. The case would be the same were one at this time to talk of a minister plenipotentiary from the United States appointing to reside, appointed to reside at the court of His Britannic Majesty. The only powers, therefore, which circumstances permit Mr. Adams to announce are those which authorize him to take a part in the negotiations for peace. The two other powers can be of no avail until the conclusion of that peace, so that it would be at least useless to produce them at present. And consequently, Mr. Adams will not act inconsistent with the design and nature of his appointment by concealing them from the court of London. Although, although the Count de Vergennes is an, unacquainted with the instructions of Mr. Adams, yet he is persuaded that they are conformable to the foregoing reflections and that they do not direct him to make an immediate communication of his powers relative to a treaty of commerce any more than they order him to make a separate peace with Great Britain. This opinion is founded on that which the King's ministry entertained of the wisdom, prudence, and fidelity of Congress. Three, it is to be observed that the English ministry would consider that communication as ridiculous, so that it is deceiving oneself to suppose that it will engage them to enter into any conference or to say anything more than what is contained in the resolutions of Parliament, namely that they will listen to the Americans and receive them into favor when they return to their former allegiance. Stop. You see what they just said to, to John Adams? They said, yeah, we'll listen to you Americans, uh-huh, and receive them into favor when they return to their former allegiance. See, they're not trying to recognize these Americans. They said, nah, y'all ain't Americans, y'all are British. You're expatriates of Brit Great Britain, and right now your status is what? Treasonous. So now they're going to war with these people. Okay, so you gotta understand what's happening. They, Great Britain told them, you need to come back to your former allegiance. America's trying to be recognized by their own mother to be somebody different. You gotta understand what's going on here, Morris. This is how America came to be. Let's continue. It can answer no good purpose to draw from them such an answer, nor can the United States want such an answer, to inform them of the present sentiments of the Court of London, and much less to prepare with councils and arms to resist them. It is astonishing to talk of preparations of councils and arms when the war is raging in all its fury, when it has now lasted six years and England has not made an overture to the Americans that can authorize them to believe that she would agree to their independence. Stop. See? Great, Great Britain is not recognizing the Americans. They still don't. They, they still don't. Right? Well, after the War of 1812, they did recognize them, but they still think they're treasonous. That's the way they feel. They think we're still a colony. Yeah, they still think it's a colony, right? That, that is true. They see the United States as still a British parliament. That's why you look at the Black's Law Dictionary, and the Black's Law Dictionary still talks about it still under the British regal rules.
That's why the Bar Association, the British, the Credit Registry, so Great Britain is still ruling over here, right? With their feudalism, right? Their color of law, right? Their color of authority, right? Great Britain is still ruling, all right? Okay, let's continue. Four, the English ministry would either return no answer, or if they did, it would be an insolent one. In case of the latter, why should a man needlessly expose himself to insult and, there, and thereby make himself the laughingstock of all the nations who have not yet acknowledged the independence of the United States. Stop. You see what just happened? Listen. Number four, the English ministry would either return no answer, or if they did, it would be an insult one. So in other words, Great Britain say, yeah, we'll respond to your letters, but all we're going to do is insult you, right? In case of the latter, why should a man needlessly expose himself to insult? They're talking to John Adams. And thereby make himself the laughing stock of all the nations who have not yet acknowledged the independence of the United States of America. You see, they didn't have no existence. This is this is 1780. United States of America didn't even exist even then. So how the heck is Moors calling themselves Americans when Great Britain didn't even recognize their own people as being Americans? This is 1780, this is happening. How did Moors end up being Aboriginal Americans when even Great Britain didn't even recognize Americans? The word America is a modern term in history. There's no such thing as Aboriginal America. It's just a name on a contract. Let's continue. But there is reason to believe Mr. Adams would receive no answer because the British ministry would not think themselves bound to return one to a man who assumes a character which the court of London must consider an insult. It should not be forgotten that that court always considers the Americans Listen. as rebellious subjects. With such an opinion, how could Lord Germain receive a letter from Mr. Adams taking upon himself the character of minister to an potentiary from the United States of North America? Stop. Let's read it again. This is Great Britain talking to John Adams. It should not be forgotten, John Adams, that the court always considers the Americans as rebellious subjects. So who are the Americans? Expatriates of Great Britain. But Moors keep saying they are the Americans. And Great Britain is saying the Americans are rebellious subjects of Great Britain. You gotta see the history here, boys. That's why I'm taking my time to go through this. We were never Americans and never will be Americans. Okay, mother, let's, let's take it from here. With. With such an opinion, how could Lord Germain receive a letter from Mr. Adams taking upon himself the character of minister plenipotentiary from the United States of North America? How could that minister bear the mention of a treaty of commerce which can only take place between independent nations? Stop. See, treaties can only be signed by who? Nations that are recognized, that are independent. But the Americans were trying to become recognized Americans, and Great Britain said, y'all ain't Americans. You're rebellious British subjects. Because America didn't exist at that time. Gotta catch what's happening here. Okay, well. These observations will convince Mr. Adams that France has no occasion for the expedient which he proposes to discover the sentiments and dispositions of the Court of London, and that we are already perfectly acquainted with what we ought, ought and may expect from it in the present situation of affairs. Five, the silence or the answer of the English ministry, let which will happen, will neither alarm nor arouse the people of England. That people, without doubt, desire peace and an accommodation with America. But we find that only some individuals talk of independence, and these more than from a spirit of opposition than from conviction. There, 
never has been a single motion made in Parliament tending to grant that independence. Yet the people have friends and protectors in Parliament. From this, Mr. Adams may judge into what embarrassment the announcing his powers would throw the ministry. Stop. Great Britain is laughing, John Adams. How you walking over here with your so-called nationality card claiming that, that you got state ID? You don't have no state ID, John Adams. You got a nationality card. Haven't nobody recognized you as being Americans? Great Britain ain't recognizing you as being Americans. This is how Great Britain's talking to them. How you come talking to us like you think you're an official of a state? You're not the official of no state. You're a de facto. Everything you're saying to us, John Adams, is patently frivolous and arbitrary and capricious because we didn't recognize you. Why am I talking like this to the Moors right now? You gotta understand what's happening. Moors, he's saying they're Americans. Even Great Britain said these people wasn't Americans. You gotta understand what I'm saying here, Moors. I'm trying to help you understand what's happening here. This is law and history. They're London courts and they're parliamentary uh, procedures saying they don't recognize these so-called Americans. I told them they were what? Rebellious British subjects wanting to be recognized as Americans. Let's continue. Six, England as well as the rest of Europe are perfectly acquainted with the nature of the engagements which subsist between France and the United States. The King caused a declaration to be made by this ministry on the 13th of March, 1778, that he had not secured to himself any exclusive privileged by the Treaty of Commerce of the 6th February of the same year. And His Majesty has confirmed that declaration in a writing republished by his order, so that the plenipotentiary powers of Mr. Adams can disclose nothing new either to England or to the other powers of Europe. And the false opinion of the Court of London in this matter can be no obstacle to peace. If such an obstacle existed, the English ministry would themselves find means to remove it if they were determined to make deep peace depend upon that. Seven, it is certain that the whole English nation and even the ministers themselves wish for peace, but it has been observed that there has not been a single motion made in favor of the independence of America. False. How can Moors call themselves Americans when Great Britain don't even recognize them as being Americans? This false connotative term that Moors have been using to call themselves Moorish Americans, this word America didn't come into the language until after the 17th century. <clears throat> Great Britain don't recognize their own people as Americans. The only person recognized the 13 colonies as being Americans was who? The, the Sultan of Morocco. He was the only one at that time. And then he called in France and Spain and the Netherlands to come in and represent the United States of America to start to defeat the British. You gotta understand, the only way the 13 colonies end up being Americans is because Moroccans protected them. And now these very Moroccans are calling themselves Americans. You gotta understand what's happening here, boys. Let's start from the top again, Mark. Thank you. It is certain that the whole English nation and even the ministers themselves wish for peace, but it has been observed that there has not been a single motion made in favor of the independence of America. Certainly the plenipotentiary powers of Mr. Adams will not change the present dispositions of the people in that respect. And consequently, the communication that might be made of them will neither facilitate nor accelerate the conclusion of peace. Eight, this is a sensible reflection. It proves that Mr. Adams is himself convinced that there are circumstances which may induce him to conceal his powers. The King's ministry think that such circumstances will continue till the English nation shall show a disposition to acknowledge the independence of the United States. That acknowledgement will not be facilitated by proposing a treaty of commerce, for the English are at present well persuaded that they will have such a treaty with America, 
when they shall judge it proper. They have besides, as Mr. Adams has himself mentioned in his letter of the 19th of February last, a full knowledge of his commission so that the communication of his full powers will teach them nothing new in this respect. Nine, in answer to this paragraph, it may be observed that there is not an Englishman who is not persuaded that the United States are disposed to grant the advantages of commerce to their ancient metropolis. But it would be a very difficult task to persuade an Englishman or any thinking being that by granting independence in exchange for these advantages, the court of London would make an honorable and advantageous peace. If this was the real sentiment of the people of England, why have they for these six years past, without murmuring, furnished ruinous supplies for subduing America? See that? Great Britain wants to subdue who? America. What does that mean? They want to bring them into the courts and prosecute all of them for being treasonous, for being rebellious British subjects. So how can they bring them into the London courts if they turn around and recognize them as Americans? That means Americans have their own jurisdiction. So they were going to keep them as British subjects so they can bring them into their courts. And they're saying, saying that the, the subjects of Great Britain that were living in Great Britain at the time didn't care nothing about the 13 colonies. They didn't care nothing about the 13 colonies wanting their sovereignty and independence to call themselves Americans. They saw it as blasphemy. Let's continue. 10. The English ministry either have sincere intentions of making peace or they mean to amuse and penetrate the designs of Spain. In the first case, they will express the conditions on which they desire to treat. They will then be obliged to explain their views and their demands with regard to America. They will assuredly forget nothing which they think will forward peace. And upon agreeing to her independence, their first care will be to demand equal privileges with France in regard to commerce. On the contrary, if the English ministry only means to amuse Spain, to penetrate her designs, and to slacken her preparations for war, Mr. Adams should do the Ministry of Madrid the justice to believe that they will have sat sagacity enough to discover their views and have understanding and prudence sufficient to determine on the contact they ought to pursue. 11. If Mr. Adams is as sure as he is of their existence that the English ministers have no intentions of making peace on terms which France and America can agree to, to what purpose communicate to them at present powers which cannot be made use of until after the peace? How can Mr. Adams persuade himself that the court of London will be seduced by the bait of a treaty of commerce while it still manifests an invincible repugnance to acknowledge the independence of America? Whenever it shall be disposed to acknowledge that independence, it will of, it, it will of itself propose the conditions on which it will think it proper to grant it. And Mr. Adams may rest assured that it will not forget the article of commerce. Then will be the proper time for him to produce his plenipotentiary powers. In the meantime, it is necessary to pursue measures for the establishing the foundation of that negotiation, namely the independence of America. And that can only be effected by carrying on the war with vigor and success. Woo! Well, great, great, tell America, yeah, we'll recognize you as soon as we get our foot off your neck. We finish kicking your behind. We finish kicking your behind with these cannons and this musket gun, right? So what eventually happens? France and Spain comes in, as well as the Netherlands. There was a treaty signed called the Franco, uh, the Franco-American Treaty Alliance of 1778, okay? The Franco-American Treaty Alliance of 1778. Soon after that, Spain and the Netherlands joined into that same alliance, and they all came and defeated the British, right? So then America finally got its independence shortly thereafter, right? But John Adams is over here begging for Great Britain to back up off of them. Because at this time, there was a war going on. 
The war started in 1775. It lasted all the way to 1783, right? So in the midst of all that, John Adams is acting like he's the plenipotentiary of his state. And he's sitting there with a nationality card instead of state ID. This is what the Moors got to understand. So right now, the United States of America and the United States doesn't want to recognize Moors who have what? Listen to me, Moors, please. You got a nationality card. You needed state ID, but the only way to get state ID, you needed what? Nation. You needed your own constitution. You need a nation. You need your own nation state. That outlines what? Okay, now you go down to what? Dominions. This is the dominions of Ampac. This is our latitude and longitude. Right? But who recognizes a more state? More states get to recognize themselves because it was a successor of the empire. Right? But in order for us to have proper recognition, we have to check the applicable boxes of what was commonly known as the customary norms of international law. And the customary norms of international law says you must ratify, deposit, and promulgate your constitution with the United Nations, Article 102. Does that mean you're looking for recognition? No. You're just giving them notice that you exist. What gives you the right to now restore your state is because of the act of Algeceres preamble. The Sultan wrote the preamble. What the preamble? It's the triple principle. It says what? The Moors have a right to what? Sovereignty and independence. What does that mean? Statehood. That the Moors have a right to what? Integral domains. That way you protect your domains with what? Your courts, your laws. And right after that, you get into step number three, economic liberty without any inequality. This is what the Sultan wrote in the treaties. The Moors had every right to restore their states. Because this is Morocco. You don't have to get permission to be Moroccan. You just start to now act like you're the absolute successor of the estate. You don't wait for permission. You just act with your pen. But you're not American. Okay. Remember I said we're going to read the letter of George Washington? Moors keep thinking they're Americans. You're not Americans. We're going to get into this letter of 1791. Keep in mind that George Washington wrote a letter in 1789, petitioning the Sultan, say, hey, man, I got a new constitution. It's called the United States of America, right? That's when America was formally recognized through that constitution of being the United States of America, right? 1789, because prior to that, they were the Continental Congress. Why? Because Brit Great Britain wouldn't let them be Americans. You got to understand what's happening here. Great Britain said, you can't be Americans. So they said, okay, we'll be continental Congress. Then the Sultan says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to recognize you as being the Americans. George Washington puts together his constitution, right? He ratifies, deposits, and promulgates it with the Sultan in 1789, more specifically, December 1st, 1789. And after that, the Sultan said, okay, I'll change the name on the treaty to the United States of America now instead of the Continental Congress. It was fully ratified. Okay, let's get into this letter from George Washington. Because Morris keeps saying they're Americans. You're not Americans, you're Moroccan. Okay, Mother, from the top. From George Washington to the Emperor of Morocco, 31 March, 1791. To the Emperor of Morocco. Great and magnanimous friend. Separated from an immense ocean from the more ancient nations of the earth and little connected with their politics or proceedings, we are late in learning the events which take place among them and later in conveying to them our sentiments thereon. The death of the late emperor, your father, and our friend, a glorious memory, is one of those events which, though distant, attracts our notice and concern. Receive great and good friend, my sincere sympathy with you on that loss, and permit me at the same time to express the satisfaction which, with, with which I learned the accession of so worthy a successor to the imperial throne of Morocco, and to offer you the homage of my sincere congratulations. 
May the days of your majesty's life be many and glorious, and may they ever mark the era during which a great people shall have been most prosperous and happy under the best and happiest of sovereigns. The late emperor very soon after the establishment of our infant nation manifested his royal regard and amity to us by many friendly and generous acts, and particularly by the protection of our citizens in their commerce with his subjects. And as a matter, and as a further instance of his desire to promote our prosperity and intercourse with his realms, he entered into a treaty of amity and commerce with us for himself and his successor to continue for 50 years. The justice and magnanimity of our majesty leave us full of confidence that the treaty will meet your royal patronage also, and it will give me a great satisfaction to be assured that the citizens of the United States of America may expect from your imperial majesty the same protection and kindness which the example of your illustrious father has taught them to expect from those who occupy the throne of Morocco and to have your royal word, that they may count on a due observance of the treaty which connects the two nations in friendship. This will be delivered to your majesty by our faithful citizen, Thomas Barclay, whom I name consul for these United States in the dominions of your majesty, and who to the integrity and knowledge qualifying him for that office, unites the peculiar advantage of having been the agent through whom our treaty with the late emperor was received. I pray your majesty to protect him in the exercise of his functions for the patronage of the commerce between our two nations and those who carry it on. May that God whom we both adore bless your imperial majesty with long life, health, and success and have you always great and magnanimous friend under his holy keeping. Written at Philadelphia the 31st day of March in the 15th year of our sovereign and independence from your good and faithful friend, Washington, George Washington. You see, Morris, George Washington understood that he was under the protection. Who was under protection? George Washington, the United States of America, is under the protections of Moroccan law. Moors are Moroccans. Our job was to protect the citizens of the United States of America because they were under our protections. They were under the protections of what? Of our treaties. See right here? The treaties which connect the two nations in friendship. And George Washington wants to observe those treaties. Because they came under our protections. What happened? They signed the Treaty of Peace and Friendship in 1787. George Washington changed the name in 1789 to the United States of America. Then Sidi Muhammad transitions. He dies. His son becomes the new sultan in 1790, 1791. And what happens? George Washington starts to freak out, right? He says, oh, Lord have mercy. What just happened? Okay. So George Washington says what? I have some concerns. Why is he concerned? Because he was concerned that the new sultan might not honor the treaty. And if that's the case, guess who's going to be coming and knocking on the United States of America's door soon after? Great Britain. Right? So who's protecting the United States of America? The Moors. What type of Moors? The Moor Rockins. Under what type of law? More rocky law. And now today, the very same more rockings are calling themselves Americans. You can't be both sides of the contract. George Washington said what? He says it himself. He says it right here. Listen, Morris. Treaty which connects the two nations. What are two nations? Morocco and America. So when Moors say they're Americans, you're saying you're on that side of the contract? Because Morocco is on this side of the contract. America is on that side of the contract. Because even George Washington said there's two nations. 
But when Moore say I'm a, I'm a rocket American, you're saying you're on both sides of the contract. Right? Now listen, let's go back to the nationality card as we start to wrap up. Moore is saying they're Moroccan American. Because you said it right here that you're Moroccan American, and you said that's the American original flag. But you just said you're Mor Moroccan American. So if you say you're a Moroccan American, then tell me who the heck the Americans are in the contract. If you say you're the American, you can't be the Moroccan and the American. You can't be both parties of the contract. If this is a square table, American sitting over there, Moroccan sitting over here, and you claim to be the Moroccan American. You claim in both sides of the negotiating table of the contract that's already been signed. Go ahead, Mark. Well, they can't be original, aboriginal. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about that. Thank you, Mother. So to turn around and call yourself a rap aboriginal American, where did you get that from? No Webster's Dictionary. You didn't get that from no legislation. You didn't read a treaty that says that. You never read that nowhere other than Noah Webster's Dictionary, and you know it. Show me a legislation from the United States of America or the United States or any Moroccan treaty, declaration, convention, or resolution that said that Moors are Americans. Show it to me. It don't exist. But what I can show you is legislation after legislation after legislation that calls us Moroccans, that calls us subjects in Morocco. The Moors must understand we're committing fraud when we call ourselves Americans. The worst part is we said we're Moroccans with a Moroccan flag calling ourselves American. We got to stop doing this. We got to fix this. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it real here, Moors. Or what? Or what? Okay. Well, I said all I have to say this as we start to close out. Or Article 102. It's going to end up adjudicating you as a Moorish subject because Moorish subjects have a nationality card. You're stuck between America and Morocco. You're right in between, right in the middle. You're stateless. So you're going to return back to the United States of America and keep that driver's license and that birth certificate or you're going to consent back to a competent Moorish state Okay, as I start to wrap up, you're going to return back to a competent more state, more. You have to enact a constitution, more. You need a constitution in each of the territories. The United States is claiming 50 plus territories in Morocco. And the only people that can restore the constitution is Moroccans, not Americans. have to understand the history. If not, we're doomed to repeat it again. I'm going to tell you what Noble Dryly told us all. Just because you was born here doesn't make you a citizen. Noble Dryly understood he tried to write a constitution. For who? Moroccans. We got to understand what's going on here, boys. We have been in fellowship instead of scholarship. I just gave you a brief history in less than an hour and a half. And Moore has been calling themselves Americans for decades. And in an hour and a half, I just broke down the Moorish science to you. Just a snapshot of history. I showed you a timeline that says Morocco, 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 America. A Morocco, 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 Morocco. And you choose to call yourself American out of all that legislation I showed you, all that history. We got to stop doing this because only Moroccans can call up on council court. That must be understood. I end with that. Islam.